Oh my god, it's like the 30, the, the, it's like the 30 series stuff just never ends. And that's okay, this is the launch that keeps on giving. In fact, there was a, Phil was showing me a chart that someone made on Reddit that's like value based, I guess, like performance per dollar type of derivative. Yeah, this chart right here shows you exactly the way everyone's talking about it. The Corsair Vengeance A4100 offers a professional streaming setup out of the box with the included Elgato 4K60 Pro video capture card capable of recording 4K HDR10 gameplay at 60 FPS. The Vengeance A4100 series features high performance Ryzen 7 3000 series processors and an NVIDIA RTX 20 series video card with plenty of performance to play today's top titles with incredible detail and frame rates. To see the complete spec list and to learn more, click the link in the description below. All right, so my Twitter has really been uh, very active with people asking me various questions about 30 series. So I figured it'd be important to kind of make a single video that I can sort of just link people to instead of having to answer these questions over and over and over. Um, and then what I can do is I can just timestamp, you know, link the video to the person asking a question if it's on this list, and then you can just immediately get your answer without me having to kind of drive myself crazy with writing the same responses over and over. Don't get me wrong, I like answering these questions and launches like this is when it's fun to be able to have the information kind of first and be able to share with you what I can, NDA obviously you know, dictating what I can and can't say yet. Um, that's okay, there's a lot of questions people have and I'm gonna answer those and set those records straight today. So let's start off with the obvious, the power connectors. Um, it, it, this one was one that sort of made it to publicity, to public, to publicity. The 12 pin connector was leaked prior to the launch. And that is that smaller pin, like it's got 12 pins, but it's smaller than an eight pin actually, about the same size as an eight pin, I guess. But it's a special connector that doesn't exist on any power supplies. So one of the questions that I get is, will all the 30 series cards have that connector? Well, no. Right now, none of the add-in board partners, or AIBs, that's like the EVGAs, the MSIs, the Colorfuls, the Gigabytes, the Zotax, um, Asus, these brands, all right now, all their cards, as far as I can tell, and I've talked to many of them, do include standard PCI Express power cables. Now this one here, you can almost guarantee they're all 8-pin. Um, and that's because the power limits on these cards is much higher than the 20 series. In fact, the 3080 is showing 320 watts and the, the 3090 is showing 350 watts. That is 100 watts higher than a 3080 or 2080 Ti, which is a 250 watt TDP card. So for whatever reason, they, des they redesigned the connector, which is kind of funny to be able to draw that kind of power technically from two eight pins because you need two eight pins to connect to the adapter, which I guess is part of the point I'm making here is if you buy a Founders Edition card, um, it comes with the adapter in the box. For Digital Foundry's unboxing already showed this. Um, it comes with the adapter that goes from two eight pins to a 12 pin. The problem is it's a real short adapter, so you got the plugs all hanging down in your case, which looks really bad. But that kind of segue, segues me on to the next part of this here is, like I said, only the Founders Edition cards have the 12 pin. If you get an EVGA card, Asus, whatever, they are all gonna use standard PCI Express power pins, eight pins, whether it be two or three. Some of the big cards require three uh, which isn't the first time we've seen that. Heck, our 2080 Ti uh, MSI Gaming X Trio uses three eight pin power connectors. Is it three eight pin or is it eight pin and a six pin? Regardless, it's three, doesn't really matter. But power supply companies though are, are kind of coming up with a solution to this. If you have a modular power supply, um, a, a lot of companies now are making replacement modular PCI Express cables that terminate to that 12 pin. So for instance, let's say you have an EVGA uh, Platinum 2 1300 watt or 1200 watt power supply or whatever. And I know that sounds like a lot, but trust me, you're gonna be overclocking these cards. You might actually need a bigger power supply. The, um, they are gonna be coming out with a connector that basically goes from two eight pin PCI Express modular cables into the back of the power supply that then connect together into one like sleeve or whatever, and then they're sleeved to the 12 pins. You have a nice, clean, single type of connector run going to the graphics card. Um, and that's specifically to support the amount of Founders Edition cards out there that people are gonna be buying. Um, that's, it's funny because that means they're technically supporting the competition, because let's not forget, Nvidia is also in competition with these AIBs because of the fact that they are also in retail of selling the Founders Edition card, which I guess is another perfect segue to the card designs. So this is where I think there's a huge level of confusion. There are three different boards, essentially. Ever since the Founders Edition card launched, the Founders Edition is a custom reference card. Let me back up a little bit. Prior to 
the Pascal series cards, or heck, even the 900 series cards, um, you couldn't really go and buy direct from NVIDIA a graphics card. You could in some instances. There was a couple of occasions where they were like, oh, we got a few to sell. But they weren't in the business of selling cards. They were in the business of selling design. And then the AIBs buy the designs and buy the products and the chips and all that from the manufacturer, which is in this case, NVIDIA. They're the designer and slash manufacturer, whether it's done through TSMC or whatever. And then the board partners build their cards based off of those designs and obviously they have to buy the chips from NVIDIA. And the same is true for AMD cards as well. But then what happens is NVIDIA goes, here's the product, like here's the, the chip, the die. Here's our design spec known as the reference. Now AIBs could choose to just take the reference blueprints, send them off to manufacturing, get it all tooled, get all the robots plucking parts on there and sending it off and there you go. That's the reference design. The reference in the Founders Edition though are not the same. The layout is identical. The component placement is identical. But the Founders Edition card is the first time NVIDIA went into business of selling direct to the public their own edition of graphics cards. So they take their own reference design and then they even beef it up even more. Better quality chokes, better quality MOSFETs, better quality uh, capacitors. The dies obviously come from themselves. Whether or not you know, they actually keep the best bin dies or not is always up for debate. They say they don't, I believe. But the Founders Edition card is a boosted up version of the reference card. So that's where a lot of the confusion is now moving forward onto the 30 series in that you have a reference card that exists. That's a blueprint, that's the layout, that's the memory arrangement, the power delivery, which is what, up to 18 phase, I think on this one. And the manufacturer can choose, and by, or excuse me, the AIB can choose to purchase that design and produce it. Or they can take the reference spec, which says you need this type of power delivery, you need this die, you need this memory arrangement, you need this bus design, and then they can manufacture and design their own custom cards, which is what we're used to seeing. The For the Win 3s, the MSI Gaming X Trios, the Asus Strix, all of those are custom cards built off of the reference specs. This time, the Founders Edition card does not conform to the reference design. It's a custom board. For the first time, NVIDIA said, here's the design, and then they took the design and modified it further to create their own AIB. They are their, their own AIB at that point. So you've got the NVIDIA cards, the ASUS cards, the EVGA cards, and all of them now, not really conforming to a reference card itself, and neither does NVIDIA. So the reason why we're talking about that leads me to the next discussion of water blocks. Because you have to understand the boards to understand water blocks. Now, what happens typically in these launches of families uh, of graphics cards? This happened with 20 series, 10 series, 9 series. <sighs> NVIDIA will often send a CAD to companies like the like EK Water Blocks and AlphaCool and all of them. It's not a working physical thing. It's simply a 3D CAD. And what that tells them is the location of the die, the memory, the MOSFETs, the chokes, the capacitors, anything right that's physically mounted to the surface of the board has to be accounted for the water block, obviously. You mount it down and it's gonna crush something if you don't account for it. That's why there's all those valleys and peaks under a block that gives you cutouts and stuff for things to clear. So what these manufacturers like EK Water Blocks and stuff received, as far as I can tell, is the reference card design, which is there is a rectangular reference card out there. I don't think anyone's actually producing a card based on that yet, I could be wrong but so far I haven't seen anyone tout that design because apparently it's too expensive to manufacture, so they choose to just to do their own custom boards. So the water block manufacturers basically have early access to the reference design. But the problem is if no one's manufacturing that reference block yet, or that reference card yet, the block won't attach to anything because they're all different. So it's gonna take time to see a block that will fit on a Founders Edition card with that crazy V-shaped cutout. It's gonna take a while to see a block fit on a For the Win 3 or an Asus Strix or whatever card there may be. And so what's gonna happen here is there was a lot of confusion with people going, wait a minute, EK says this block is referenced but it doesn't fit a Founders Edition, what the heck? And that's the confusion, is the Founders Edition in the past was based on the reference physical layout of the reference design, but it was custom components on that design. So I hope that clears up some of the stuff, the, the confusion on that. The best way to ensure that you have block compatibility with your card is that that block lists your specific card by name as compatible. So for instance, don't get 
3080 reference block and think it's gonna mount to your for the win or for your founder's edition or for your kingpin or whatever card you have. It needs to be listed by name. Fortunately, a lot has happened in the last five years with the, um, the, really, the, the rise in mainstream popularity with water-cooled cards and that manufacturers are now making blocks for the custom AIBs. Think about it from a block manufacturing perspective. If you had to make a block design for all the cards that are out there, think about how many dozens of SKUs that is, how much tooling and manufacturing and, and just risk taking that are enough people buying this card that we should manufacture a thousand of these blocks or 5,000 or whatever it may be and hope people buy them when they're just gonna sit on the shelf. So block manufacturers only used to produce blocks for the reference designs, but that's all changed now. So again, if it doesn't list your card specifically by name, don't trust that it's gonna fit. At least reach out to the manufacturer. Now here we go, we're gonna talk about one that I guarantee is going to be the most talked about topic. And that is, do you need PCIe Gen 4 to run these cards to their full potential? Because these cards are listed as PCIe Gen 4. Again, to understand this question and the answer, you need to understand the trends and you need to go back in time. Yes, this is why history is so important and this is why you can't erase history, whether it be good or bad, because the problem is history repeats itself over and over and over. You have to learn from it, not just ignore it. So a long time ago, I built a system for myself that had a, a, a GTX 580 in it. But at the time, the GTX 680 was the newest card, and it was like the first PCIe Gen 3 card. And the, and the RX, or the RX, the RX 580, yeah, the same numbers, right? I hate the numbering. The GTX 580 was a PCIe Gen 2 card. And there was a lot of discussion. Do you need Gen 3? Do you need Gen 3? And, and, and it's the same thing we're seeing now. And the answer is no. No, you don't need PCIe Gen 4 to get the full potential of your graphics card. There is an asterisk on that, and we're gonna talk about that in a second. But it's important to note that this question was also asked directly to NVIDIA during their Ask Me Anything on their Reddit, on their Reddit subreddit. And basically the answer was, the performance di difference is negligible. I believe they said few percent. But the problem is that I don't know what a few means, so we need, to, we need to see firsthand. They also said there's way more to take into account than just the bus width of PCIe to understand where bottlenecks can occur. And they specifically are referring to, and I think, I feel like it was a very roundabout way of saying that's AMD versus Intel answer, which we did a video on that. If you guys haven't watched it, you really should. <laughs> it's, the, it's the very first video in a series of bottlenecking that we're gonna talk about. But they, basic, they basically dropped a bombshell and was like, all of the charts that you saw, all the performance uplift that you saw was performed on a PCIe Gen 3 system. Now, do you need PCIe Gen 4? The answer is no, you do not need it. However, as we see more technologies by NVIDIA becoming more widely used by the game developers, like for instance, the decompressing of SSD data direct to the VRAM and not to the system RAM, that is also gonna be using that pipeline. It's gonna be using the PCIe Gen 4 pipeline to really maximize that. And that's why they're PCIe Gen 4 cards. And the reason for that specifically is you have to scale up the pipeline speed to scale with future technologies. And so what's happening is we know for a fact AMD's PCIe Gen 4 motherboards with Gen 4 NVMe SSDs getting 7,000 megabytes per second plus read write speed will saturate PCIe Gen 3. That's why those cap at about 5,000 megabytes per second. So if you go to a newer technology that's now sending that decompressed data direct to the graphics card, you need a bandwidth that's gonna expand with that. So PCIe Gen 4 on these graphics cards is future-proofing. Now, I hate that term to begin with. It's future compatibling with motherboards in the future and that when that technology becomes more widely adopted by the manufacturers, it is something that the manufacturers, the game developers, it's something developers too are gonna have to leverage and actually create you know, instructions for and such. Um, it has to be leveraged. It's not gonna just happen automatically. That is when you can start seeing PCIe Gen 4 be beneficial. Now, I we're gonna obviously be testing 3080s and 3090s on Gen 3 and Gen 4 systems because what we've already shown in our previous video is that there is indeed a performance difference between AMD and Intel on Gen 4 and Gen 3, but it's not because of the PCI Express, it's because of the CPU turbo clock speeds. And that matters more than the actual um, bus width of your PCI Express if you're talking raw performance for FPS not including the decompressive stuff, which decompression stuff we'll have to talk about in the future. So I, I hope that sets at least some of that 
directly, uh, well, it's never gonna settle it, but I hope that makes people out there that are afraid to purchase something thinking, well, I have a Gen 3 motherboard. I don't wanna bottleneck myself. You're not gonna bottleneck your performance through Gen 3 right now, okay? It's not gonna happen. And by the time it becomes a necessity, I'm sure you would have probably upgraded your system by that point anyway. I still think we're talking years into the future. 3090 and Titan. I'm getting a lot of questions from people asking me if I believe that a 3090 is a Titan replacement. Jensen himself said this is a Titan level card. We know for a fact, there was a while there, Nvidia sort of painted themselves in a corner and trying to say that Titan cards weren't gaming cards, but they were the exact same architecture and the exact same core and the exact same everything. In fact, the Titan water blocks and the GTX uh, 2080 Ti's and 1080 Ti water blocks were interchangeable because they're the same freaking card. Look, you can call it whatever you want. It still is what it is. What's that old saying? You can put lipstick on a pig, but it's still a pig. I don't know, that was a saying. Uh, some <laughs> south. You can put lipstick on a pig, but it's still a pig. Well, I guess that doesn't really apply, right? Yeah, it's a good thing. It's put lipstick on a pig and then kiss it. <laughs> so here's the thing, my prediction regarding this. I do believe that the 3090 is the top tier we're gonna see for 30 series, I think for its life. I don't believe they're gonna come out with a card bigger and fatter than the 3090. I hope I'm wrong, but I think instead of like, they came out with a Titan later like they always did, I think they just came out with it and like, this is, this is it, this is where we start and we go down from there. The problem is $1,500 to seven or $800 is a huge gap in pricing. And there is still that mystery queue, a PG132 PG SKU 20. And there's a lot of speculation as to what is that card. Is it a 3090 Ti? Is it a 3080 Ti? Is it a 3070 Ti? God, I hope it's not a 3070 Ti. Like I said in my previous video, you would go from hero to villain that quickly if you, if you come out with a card that's faster for around the same price, then the, please don't do that. But there's lots and lots of rumors and leaks, I guess, of websites that have mentioned the card that has disappeared. And, but the problem is, is those leaks have also mentioned 3070 Ti, but it's looking an awful lot like that SKU 20 stands for a 20 gigabytes of VRAM. Because as you know, the 3080 has 10, that's less than you actually have on a 2080 Ti, but that the 3090 has 24 gigs of VRAM. It's rumored that this could potentially be a 3080 Ti slash super 20 gigabyte variant with over 10,200 CUDA cores. That's a hell of a lot of CUDA cores. And it's almost as much as the 3090 at its 10,496, I believe it is. So I, I, I feel that if there is a card that's gonna come in the future, it's potentially gonna be at that thousand dollar price point between a 3090 and a 3080 which is gonna suck for those people that are willing to spend $800 on a 3080, because I feel like those people would also just spend 200 extra dollars on a 3080 Ti or whatever. But again, this is the risk you take as early adopters and first buyers. <laughs> but anyway, th those are the most common questions I've actually gotten on Twitter that I've kind of compiled over the last couple of days. And I feel like I just wanted to put this information out there. Um, am I saying you shouldn't go out and buy on day one? Absolutely not. And you know who's really winning? I'm seeing a lot of like, well, I'm gonna finally retire my 980 and I'm gonna laugh my way all the way to the bank because it's like the, the amount of performance increase, dude, the amount of performance increase from 980 to Pascal was, was seen as like the unimaginable jump that took place and when Nvidia was a superhero. And they're saying that that's happening now again over 20 series. The jump from a 980 to a 3070 alone, oh my God. Those of you that waited and you have that card and you're like, I'm buying a 3070, get ready for a hell of a good time. You are gonna have a party like you've never seen before when it comes to performance increase. I've seen some people say, I'm finally retiring my GTX 580. That card is almost 10 years old. Okay, the last question I get all the time is pre-orders. Jay, why is there no pre-order? This time around, I think it's because of supply and demand, limited capacity of manufacturing and getting into the United States probably due to the whole um, pandemic issue. I don't think they're doing, well, they're not doing pre-orders, period. None of the AIBs nor NVIDIA are doing pre-order. The day of embargo lift, which is the 17th for the 3080 and the 24th for the 3090, there's another date floating around that some other people I think inadvertently mentioned that they shouldn't have that you guys can go and find on your own, I'm not gonna repeat it, um, about certain stuff launching potentially sooner. I don't know when the actual like go live button to click buy is gonna be, but it's gonna be a quick draw race. Those that can get to the website, hope it doesn't crash, get through the cart and hit submit, and then hope that you don't get a bounce back later saying sorry, out of stock after they took your money and then refund you, which is gonna happen, unfortunately, it's gonna to happen to someone out there. There's no pre-orders. Uh, and I think that's just because of general availability. We know the first, the first shipment of new cards from a new family always goes out of stock. And it happened with the 20 series. I think there was a solid month, maybe more, that everything was just out of stock. 
Um, but eventually supply does normalize and then it becomes available. So also, should you sell your 20 series cards? Yes. If you think you need, if you need the money from the sale of that card to afford your new one, yes. The problem is if you need the money from the sale of that card to afford your new one and you need it prior to buying the new one, and then you sell your card and then you miss out on the launch and don't get the card, we're gonna have a while there where I sure hope you have an iGPU and you're willing to suffer with four FPS. Anyway guys, time to get out of here. I, these are questions I'm asked all the time. I was just wanted to put out a single video that I could just be like, hey, go check out this video and timestamp it. You know, be like, it's got everything I can basically answer in there. I'm really excited for this one. Can't wait to show you the performance. I'm curious as to what you guys are gonna do. Are you gonna wait for AMD's potential announcement next month? Or are you just gonna buy Nvidia anyway and, and hope that you win that quick draw? Or are you just gonna stick with whatever card you got? Answer down below what your circumstance is. I'd love to hear it. Subscribe if you're not. Lots of great content coming up on this. Um, if, you're, if, you, if you love performance and FPS at all, trust me, this is, this, is a, this is a good time to be a gamer. All right guys, thanks for watching. And as always, We'll see you in the next one. And don't ask me any more series, 30 series questions until after the embargo lift. And that's only if I didn't cover it. <laughs> <laughs>